well, if lying's got you down in the dumps and feeling blue, let me tell you about the new meta shift, which is blue farm, blue farm, and blue farm. <laughs> Welcome back to Colors Are Crutch. My name is Max Sternberg, also known as Wounded Satellite, and I'm joined, as always, by a fucking dog of a co-host. Max P, the Florian guy, the Italian man. How you doing today, Max? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing all right. Uh, it's gonna be an interesting episode. We don't have. We're not gonna go through any tournaments. We're not gonna. We're not doing a deck tech. We're not doing. You know, we're not breaking down any top 16s. We're just gonna talk through some shit that's been going on. Um, you know. Both in tournaments, going on. a lot of things have been going on. A lot of, a lot of interesting changes in CDH over the last, like, I don't know, month or two. Um, really came to a head, I think, at Pun City Three. You know, a lot of those things kind of came to be realized, and uh, we're going to talk about them. Um, primarily, one is you know the one we touched on a little bit last week, which is just the lying meta. You know, the fact that people are willing to lie now as sort of the the stat you know the way things are that's the norm you know you're going to run into people lying in tournaments and you know you should be prepared for it uh we're going to talk a little bit about you know what that looks like uh what you can do to deal with it better what we're going to do to deal with it better um while also remaining honest like i'm still not going to lie i don't think you will either right so I, there are I, people I, I you can I'm, still trust but i think i'm the poster boy for honest play <laughs> yeah yeah so we're going to talk about that a little bit. We're also going to talk about like uh, the shift in the meta that's been going on. It's, it's been going on for a long time, um, but now it's really like becoming apparent. You know what? Yeah. You know, it's almost like the, the the format's becoming a little bit solved or stagnant or whatever you want to call it. Um, so we'll talk about that. And then what else? What else are we going to talk about? We got oh, we got MTGO. a bunch of little things. Yeah, yeah, MTGO Online is a big one. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit, a little database update. Max has been having some conversations on the side. There was a new document released by the Commander Rules Committee that we're just going to make fun of, essentially, because it's <laughs> yeah, so <of> cool. <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> uh, and, and another thing to heads up for, not this coming week. We think the following week we're going to be doing our next Top 15 video. Um, it's been three months. We always love doing those. They're super fun to record. Love to look at where the format has come in these last few months and there's definitely going to be some some shifts and where some things go with the numbers so i'm actually very excited for that one and i think the following week after that at least part of an episode or maybe for the entire episode we're going to do a q a episode uh so if you have any questions for myself or max p personally or us together either magic or non-magic related please leave something in the comments below and we're going to look through all the questions that people want to ask and we'll pick out some number of them and we'll we'll do a Q&A episode because it sounds what, fun. what do the kids call that now ask me anything is that what we're doing we're doing the ask me anything sure <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and then, but then we'll like select the questions we want to answer. And we'll answer. Those. I mean, old old Facebook status <laughs> style, like this, like this post for a truth is or something. You, know? yeah, exactly. uh, you weren't even you weren't even around for those. That's the youngins that get that one. Yeah, it's, I'll do that. Uh, I'll do that. Yeah, I'm too busy posting bad memes and shit like that. But yeah, anyway, yeah. So uh, before we get into all that, just to uh, you know, put our housekeeping to rest. Uh, we are sponsored by Top Deck. Welcome to topdeck.gg, the greatest tournament software in the whole world. Whether you're running an event, playing for the biggest prize, or want to advertise your shop to thousands of players around, we have the software for you. With our amazing intuitive pairing, we make playing magic an absolute breeze. All of your customers, all your participants, they can check their standings in real time. They're right there for them. They can see their pairings, they can see their results, and they can submit their round without having to turn in any of those crappy paper slips. If you want to play Magic the best way, if you want to use the best software there is, you better go to topdeck.gg. And then, um, you know, you do some coaching. You want to talk about your coaching a little bit? Yeah, I offer CDH coaching. If that's something you're interested in, I've coached people from every single tier of getting into the format from literally picking out the first cdh deck to people who are consistently top 16 and want to get that push to top four and did uh feel free to hit me up you can find me on discord as wounded satellite or twitter as wounded satellite and we can set something up yeah, awesome so i guess with that let's just uh let's just jump into the, to some of the craziness so i think we'll start with the the hot the, the hard topic first which is just the new lying meta you know and we talked about this last week dude people are lying in all the time in tournaments now. Like if someone tells you that they're gonna get a card, they're gonna tutor to find a card, unless they show you the card, 
you should not believe that that's what they're getting at this point. Oh, I, I put in the wording of you will reveal the card when you're tutoring for it on a deal like that every time. Every single time. Like, if yep. we make that a has deal, to be the way I, now. Yeah. When, when someone says, oh, I'm just going to get interaction, I say, what piece? And then we yeah. decide on a piece, and then I say, and you will reveal it to me when you tutor for it. And they say, yes. I am very specific in my wording, because I've, I've been got so many times. You know, even the, the Final Fortune extra turn bullshit. If someone says, I'm not winning this turn, I say, and no Final Fortune bullshit, I will be getting another turn, according to you. And they say, yes. And then we have very clear no yes. gray area wording on those deals because the gray area is where people get to operate you know what i mean that's where we get to like find the sly way around what we've said so just cut out the gray area and yeah, i mean but like it's it's obviously become more prominent and it's it's frustrating that lying is i know i know after the whole situation that happened at treasure series a couple of months ago during the italian the event i won italian uh my friends made a joking sweatshirt that they actually printed out that was lying equals plus ev and they were asking if I wanted one, and I was like, no, I, I do not want that. But they've been, they've been reposting it again in these last couple of weeks because it seems to be what people are doing. And it's it's one of those things that I don't think anyone has ever felt lying does not have immediate positive reward. You can absolutely win games by lying in the short term. And so if you're barely ever playing tournaments or you're just there for one event and want to do as best as you possibly can and don't care about your reputation and what happens... Yeah, I think lying can be used very, very powerfully to win a game. The problem is, I think it has a very hard plateau and then a very strict downturn in your expected win percentage because people can't yeah. trust you. It depends on your yeah. play style. I think that it's most effective and most powerful in proactive strategies because proactive strategies don't need to politic as much generically because they're just trying to win the game. When you get towards mid-range control stacks, the slower decks that need to like work their way through the slog of a game, that's where politics and understanding and communication allows for things to happen that otherwise wouldn't happen. I've right. been able to make deals occur in games because people know they can trust me. Me saying, oh, I'm not winning this turn. I will be passing the turn with everything I currently have in my hand even though I have nine cards in hand, a bunch of mana, and they're terrified. But when I say that, people know I'm serious. So then I untap, I do whatever I was planning on doing, and I pass the turn, as I say I was going to. Yeah. That that the doesn't occur if people don't trust me, because then people are just going to counter whatever random bullshit I do that turn, or silence me on map keep, or whatever, when they well, otherwise wouldn't have to. The problem now is, like, you know, the old days of saying, hey, I'm not going to win on my turn. Don't worry, I'm not going to win on a Final Fortune turn. Like, I'm not winning on my turn. I'm going to play this, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to pass. You can't trust that anymore. Like going forward in no tournaments, should you ever trust that anymore? Be and Why? Because, because in, unless, unless you can see their hand, unless they show you their hand and they can verify that what they're saying is the truth, people are going to lie. I disagree it, with I'm you telling guys. you. I, I do want to say, I think, that is a, I think that is an overcorrection. I think that is, I'm not saying, so, so to say you have to be more cautious of it, to say you have to be more aware of who you are dealing with, I think all of that is reasonable. But to outright say you can never trust that anymore, I think is bullshit. And I there I are disagree. there are certain there are rare exceptions. There are some people who I think we will still be able to trust. Like I, like I like we have said on this program, on this on this podcast, and and we've been true to it all along. Is I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to do that kind of shady business. But other people will. So like unless you know for sure, you know this person. They're your friend. You know about them. They have a reputation, and you really feel like you can trust them. You shouldn't. I mean, because at this point, like what has happened is there's been a shift in strategy, where there's a lot of people in the community in the CDH community who have taken what happened. You know, uh, the one the tournament you won is when when this when this came to a head originally. Um, people are taking lying as a tactic, and they will promise you all kinds of things, make deals with you, whatever, and then feel perfectly fine going back on those deals. That is going to happen now at tournaments from now on. Uh, I'm not saying I'm going to do it because I'm not going to do it. And there are still people who won't. But by and large, in most situations, you should expect that people are going to lie to you. Um, and, uh, and the way to I, the way to I combat think that's that, too harsh. I think that's too harsh of a way to put him in. I, I don't think I don't think it's by and large. This is what's going to occur the majority of the time. I think it's being used selectively, and you need to be aware of when it is being used selectively and try and hinder that. I, I agree that it is more than it was. I agree that it is definitely on an increase, and I think it's something people have to be prepared for and aware of, but I do not think we have hit a place that lying is the majority. So I do not feel comfortable telling people. I'm not saying, I'm not saying every, it's the majority. Like, I'm not saying that most of the time people are lying to you, but I'm saying that you should, like, you should trust at your own risk at this point. Sure. Because you don't know when you're going to be lied, when you're going to be lied to and when you're not. And 
you don't want to be the person who gets uh, blown up by it unexpectedly, and then you know you're you know you're dealing with the aftermath of, of that happening. It's just not what you. It's not where you want to be. So like all I'm saying is going forward, when you make deals with people, like for me, unless I know you like extremely well and trust you implicitly. I cannot make a deal with you where you promise not to win on your turn unless I can see your hand and verify that you can't win on your turn. That's the way forward for me, unfortunately. Um, and I think I think I think most people should be on their guard like that at this point. Um, and the people who are lying are, are people who are well known in the community. These are some of the best players in the world um, who are comfortable, you know, doing that, misleading and not even misleading, just straight up lying at this point. Um, you know, and it's not against the rules. It's not, you know, there's nothing, you know, that prevents it. There's no penalties for it. Like the, you know, the, the fallback is, is that, you know, initially in, in the beginning, like in the first few weeks of this happening, there's going to be significant advantage to be gained by lying. But that's going to fade off very, very quickly because what's going to happen is people will adjust, people will expect it. And what you'll have is a decrease in that trust and you won't be able to make the deals that you could make in the past. And that... Well, you know, in the long term, we'll make the game harder rather than, you know, granting advantage. But in the short term, people are winning because of it. That's the reality. I, I still think it really depends on your strategy. Like, I think if you're a more proactive shell, something that's just trying to win the game efficiently, quickly, then yes, lying can be very, very powerful and a very strong tactic. And again, if you look at the, the people that we experience lying at Punt City 3, if you look at the decks they're playing, they're playing proactive decks. They're playing mostly turbo. Those are those are the strategies that works well with that type of politicking. But like, I can't be lying on Talion and expect to win games. That's not. But realistic. but even even but even with Talion, there's going to be opportunities to do that because, for example, uh, sandbagging interaction. Someone you know. Right. Asks I'm you not. If you have I'm something. not saying. I'm not saying it's going to. And gonna you say no. Do I don't have anything. Even when you do, like you, there is opportunities to lie, to gain yeah. advantage, and I think you should expect that in tournaments, it's going to happen. Yes, and again. What I'm what I'm trying to point out is my, my mm -hmm. underlying point is taking a deck like Talion or Kinnon or any mid rangey control shell, whatever you want to call it. Lying can be plus EV in very specific moments, but I believe it is net negative in the long term oh, effects. I agree. Versus on a deck like if I'm playing Rogsai, I could keep lying and I don't care because my entire mission is stop me if you can anyway. So I don't think lying will ever be negative EV on something like Rogsai. I think that that's just fine if that's if you don't, you know, morality wise, if you don't care about that and you're cool with lying. Like, yeah, I think that it's a powerful strategy on something like Rogsai, because I don't think you're going to actually see negative effects from your lying later because cool, you lied to me when you're on Rogsai. I still have to mulligan for interaction for you. I still have to play responsibly around you. It doesn't actually change anything in how you play against Rogsai because you don't trust Rogsai anyway, you know they're just trying to win the game. Versus a deck like Talion, sandbagging interaction or doing whatever, like if 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 I keep telling people I don't have it and my hand is visible and people know I'm lying and I always have it, then people aren't going to trust me in the future when I don't have it. And then I'm going yeah. to lose games because of that. There is actual no, I agree. quantifiable I, I agree with negative you. I effects. I agree with you. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I agree that long term, it is not in your interest, right, to be untrustworthy. All I'm, I'm not saying that you should lie. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying you shouldn't lie. Like, I don't support it. I don't think it's a good idea. I think it has negative EV over time. But what I'm saying is, is that as tournament grinders, as players in these tournaments, people are going to lie to you from now on. Just accept that that is the new norm. To that some extent, it's not the be. new norm. It's not the new norm. That's where I don't like your wording. I think that that's too far. I'm not saying because okay. I don't ex I don't expect the majority of people to lie. And if the majority of people are not lying, then I do not think it is the new norm. I think it is an yeah. aspect of the format you have to be aware of, and it is on an upturn, 100%. It is on an increase, but if it's not the majority, I don't think it's the norm. One thing I am curious about, what is your thought process on the comparison between lying in CDH and bluffing in poker? Oh, they're not the same thing at all for me. Because in, in poker, like half of, the, half of the game of poker is betting and trying to uh, intimidate your opponents or... Uh, or or coax them in like it that's that's the game of poker is that's how it's played you know other than that it's just what cards you're dealt or not dealt so it's a very different scenario when you're playing a multiplayer format like that's collaborative like uh, CDH it's a whole different ball game because oftentimes the table needs to work together in order to prevent someone from winning right and and 
So bluffing in CDH is a whole different animal than bluffing in poker, right? Because even though poker is, yeah, multiplayer format, like bluffing is the whole game. Bluffing is poker, right? That's part of the game. Um, CDH bluffing, you know, you know, sure you can use it at times, um, but it, it breaks down the collaborative nature of, of CDH. There's no point in a poker game, for example, where everyone's going to like, ah, oh, you know, he's got, I think he's got pocket Kings. Let's hold up a counter spell. Like <laughs> there's none right, of like that. Obviously, poker. obviously they're like, different games and they function differently, but I've, I, the way I've described CDH to people is it's a combination of blackjack, poker and chess. Interesting. With the way with the way it functions on personal interaction, revealed versus unrevealed information, and the different quantifiable amounts of them, like it is kind of a combination of those three things when you really break it down in game theory. So I've heard yeah, some people bring up the argument sure. of like why why is it unacceptable to lie in a commander game when it's totally okay to bluff in poker? And I think that there's like some level of understandable comparison there where you could say yeah, like. Which again, like the the reason Let's that it see. doesn't connect in the same way, and and what, what what you're saying, I agree with most of what you're saying. To be clear, and obviously, like I'm not a fan of lying. The the primary difference in that separates bluffing and poker and lying in CDH is the collaborative part of CDH. The fact that there's a four player pod with that communication, with that threat assessment, with the fact that you can team up on certain people. It's not just my cards versus your cards. Who has the best hand? Sure. It's who it's who uses their cards the best. But the, that's there what is separates it. There is, but there is bluffing parallels in CDH. But the bluffing in CDH that in my mind, parallels poker is very different than what we're talking about. Like, for example, uh, you have an Obnixilis, and he's a he's right now he's a four three, and I have a three three flyer, and you say I'm going to attack you, and I say if you attack me, I'm going to block with my three three, right? And I might not, I might block, I might not block. You know, bluffing would be I'm saying I'm going to block, you swing at me, and then I don't, right? That's mm -hmm. bluffing. The equivalent to me, that's the equivalent of bluffing in CDH versus lying in cdh which is very different than bluffing in poker right True. because you know it, it, there's no point in poker where you're like i have you know i'm i'm not gonna win don't worry i'm not gonna win like it, that's not how it works either you have the cards that win or you don't right and all you're trying to do with betting is try to convince the table that either you have it or you're trying to convince them you know you don't have it bet against me right it's <laughs> very different um i like the comparison like combining blackjack chess and and poker, I don't know. You know I guess blackjack is the whole mathematical nature of it, um, mm -hmm. you know. But I think there's a whole other level to it too. Like it, it reminds me of like warfare. Like CDH is more like warfare because you have multiple entities fighting, and the, the, the engagement is very complicated. You know, at times your allies, at times your enemies, and and all of that adds to to it as well. Uh, which is also why like being trustworthy is an important uh, attribute because in order to form those alliances to keep you from losing the game. You got to be trustworthy, and if you're not, you're going to have a really hard time doing that. I mean, um, I don't know about you, but if I sit down at a blackjack table and the person next to me is doing dumb shit and not playing correctly, they're my enemy. Fuck that guy. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> like, I hate, I hate when people you're play so bad because yeah. they just what? you can't take a hit on a six. What are you doing? Stop Dude, it! On, on, you don't even understand. Like, I the oh, no. of, yeah, don't don't get, don't yeah, get yeah. started. Don't get me started. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I, I, I'm, I, get, I, up and, I get up and I get up. I'm the guy. I'm like, whatever. Do what you want. Like, do what you want, dude. I don't care. No, it, it like, mathematically oh, lowers I know, your odds. I know, but I'm not. I'm you know I, I'm not there. Like, I'm not, I don't give. A, I don't. First of all, I don't like gambling anymore because it's like someone's stealing my wallet every time. So, I don't, so I my don't do my favorite trick, because if you actually look at the way blackjack works, the odds on blackjack are approximately like fifty point one to the house and forty nine point nine to you. They're really good odds. So if you're yeah. playing correctly you and not counting cards then you're functioning on those parameters which will have a natural oscillation of up and down around where you started in with a slight downturn of you going down and the house going up that's how it's naturally going to occur but if you follow natural oscillations you know it's really likely you go down 30 bucks up 50 bucks whatever so i would love to go to casinos and say how much is the all you can eat buffet or how much is the all you can eat sushi and they'd be like oh it's 40 dollars," and i would just go to a blackjack table until i was up 40 or 50 bucks and then stop and then go eat dinner you just yeah. follow the you just, yeah. just let it oscillate yeah, yeah, yeah. up. You get, a, you get a slight you get a slight upward oscillation, you say, Great, stop there. And that's how you actually win money. The problem is if you don't stop, then you lose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean I, I've seen some bad things happen at casinos. Like I think my worst experience yeah. was at a craps table where I was playing craps. It was just two dollar craps. Nice and easy, off strip, you know, good time. And this dude walks up and he's wearing a suit, like he's dressed to the nines. He goes and he puts like thirty thousand dollars down on the in, on a field bet. Loses it. Right, puts another thirty thousand dollars on the field bet, loses it. Put a third thirty thousand dollars on the field bet, loses it, and you could just see that that was money he did not have to lose, you know. And you see him just like you see that like 
you know, addicted gambler look in his face and watch him just walk away, you know, and that is just, just not a good feeling. So I'm not, I'm not, clear, I'm not we are not, gambling. we are not pro gambling. If you have a gambling addiction, no. call one of those hotlines to help you Yeah, call hotline. <laughs> gamble, gamble <laughs> responsibly. We only gamble with clout here on color. Sure. And crunch. No, I, I do enjoy gambling. I'm just like not one of those people that's it. like, oh, I got to win it. it back. If I lose, I lose. And most of the time I win I a little bit. It. Especially because those games are like, there's so little skill involved. There's so much luck. Like, Fuck like you. you need to not know. No, if mean, you actually, if you actually look at, if you look poker's at all the of the games in the casino, if you look at all the games in the casino, it is a very correlated line between the less skill involved, the more likely the house is to win. So that's why slots are the worst odds. Yes. Casino, if it's you all play, random. if you play mathematically correct, you limit your odds of losing a lot that's about all you can do and then you just hope I you play, get lucky i play mathematically correct <laughs> so yeah, I, but even I when you're know. even when you're perfect even when you're mathematically correct the odds are still against you like you were like playing against the house yes you're still I, losing. I agree i agree that the odds are against me and that's why you have to know when to stop that's what's important so me saying cool i'm just gonna go win 50 bucks real quick and then stop is not me saying, "Oh, I want to put in a hundred dollars, and I, I expect to come out of here yeah, rich, yeah, yeah. man." No, it's me yeah, saying, "I'm good. just gonna you're go good. make my dinner." <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so, so back to li back to lying. So, you know, I, I think we, you know, fundamentally agree for the most part. Like, I think the only disagreement we have is just how prevalent it is and whether or not it's a new norm. Um, you know, I, I do think it's become, a, it's going to become more and more prevalent going forward. I think that's just the way things are. Uh, and everyone should prepare themselves for it. When you go into a tournament and you get into a situation where someone's offering you a deal, like you need to either know that person, look them in the eye, read them that they're going to tell the truth, uh, or you need to verify. Like you need to see their hand. You need to, you, need, you know, you need to see the tutor targets. Like you need to do more due diligence than you had to do in the past, past to protect yourself at this point. Agreed? Yeah, I think so. I mean, my, my experience just might be overall a little skewed, I think, to some extent, because I'm a known player and I, it's like known that I don't lie. So I think as a result of me being an honest person, people are more likely to play honest against me. I think that has been my experience. So I don't feel the effects as strongly. It's very, very rare that someone has been dishonest with me in tournament games. It has happened only a couple of times. And I've played a lot of tournament games. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm not even like, and just to be clear, I'm not even like... I just think it, most of the time it's a mistake, but I'm not mad about it. Like, I'm not mad at these people necessarily. Like, I I now expect it. Like, I've sort of adopted it into my psyche at this point. Like, I'm not, like, going to be surprised or upset. Like, I'm just going to be like, okay, you know, that's that's now part of the, this game that I play, and I need to adjust, and that's the way it is. Well, if lying's got you down in the dumps and feeling blue, let me tell you about the new meta shift, which is blue farm, blue farm, and blue farm. <laughs> yeah, and if you're tired of blue farm, then, well... Oh, shit, because you're going to be playing Blue Farm. Yeah, a little yeah. bit of to say. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. A sprinkle you know, it, of Kinnon. You know, it, it's kind of it's kind of crazy. So if you, it, you know, I, I was looking at this the other day, looking at, the, at the, this morning, actually. Let me go to EDH Top 16 here real quick. So, you know, the first easy look is, you know, let's not even add any filters. We're just looking at, like, April of last year through now. Um, and you look at, you know, the conversion rate of Blue Farm, the only deck that has a better conversion rate in like the top, I don't know, 30 decks, you know, that have reasonable levels of participation is Rogsai with like 24.7, 3% conversion rate versus Blue Farm at 24.14. And Blue Farm has almost triple. Loki Magda <laughs> as well. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, Magda, <laughs> sure, sure. But Magda is still lower. Magda's at 23%, 23.46%. You know, um, Kenan at one point did hit 22. Well, but but, there was, there but was listen to this. But listen to this. 584 entries on Timnacrom, and that's over 64 in size from April of last year, versus 186 rocks. So mm -hmm. triple, triple the number of entries and a higher conversion rate. That's insane. That's actually insane. And it gets even worse when you like lower the tournament size. So if you drop the tournament size down to say 30, all right, which is, or we'll do 32 because that's silver events and up, okay? The number of entries at that point is we've got 1,187 blue farm entries with a 36.23% conversion rate. Mm -hmm. So over a third of blue farms being entered in tournaments 
over the last year are top 16 minimum. Kind of That's wild. crazy. That's crazy. I mean, we, we've, we've talked about it before. Like Blue Farm was always a good deck. It was always a deck that people respected, viewed as in that upper echelon. Lord of the Rings, man. Because if you looked at Blue Farm before, when I, when I first got into the format, which was a few months before Lord of the Rings was released, the conversation at that time was when I was talking to people about Blue Farm decks and their flexibility and how people built them, it was like, oh, you got like 10 flex slots that really swap around. And if that, yeah. If, yeah. if that, that was the high end, you know what I mean? But Lord of the Rings cut out the fat and it took away people to use, you know, some people were on Containment Priest, some people were on Dothy, some people were on this, some people were on that. Whatever they were running to fit their Blue Farm style, that was the maybe slightly suboptimal but preferential fat of the deck that turned into orcish bowmasters lotho born upon a wind like just gas gas objectively the correct things to play type cards right and that's right. where blue farm is mostly at now now blue farm has like three to five flex slots it's a very it's very different and even you know the the flex slots that you're choosing from are all still top tier magic cards that are completely viable and good you know if you want your sarah's yes. ascendant for the beat down if you want your brina for the grindy card advantage if you want a blind obedience, if you choose to Which play a curse do you totem, want? Yeah. You know, what that that you know, do you want to run a windfall as well? Like it's not like they're bad cards they're putting in, but Blue Farm, because of this, has become egregiously consistent. And people have also figured out the mulligan philosophy significantly more, where it's just, hey, plan A, B, C, D, and E is card advantage. You know? You you your your plan A is Ristic Mystic, your plan B is Esper Timna, and your plan C is Krom. And, yeah. and people have realized, oh, Talion and the One Ring aren't really worth it because we already have better card advantage engines and I don't want to be drawing into more card advantage engines. I want to be drawing into gas, which is also part of how Blue Farm has changed, where Blue Farm used to be a tiny bit slower and it was like, eventually I get to my breach and I win the game. I trust and I have these hate bearers that are Temnadongers and it was just like a little bit slower of an overall strategy. If you look at Blue Farm and how it's designed now, it has turned into Rogsai plus white with card advantage in the command zone. Yes. It is yes. it is it is it is literally Rogsai. It is it, it is like the same proactive Rogsai package to win the game with Breach in a turbo fashion paired with Silence Effects and Timna. Yep. Like that's what the deck is right now and it's yep. wild. It's so so good. Um I've played it a, a bunch recently for just like some random fun games and I had that one tournament that I said was the easiest morning of my life. It's boring as fuck, but deck works yeah. and it, yeah. it like it is part of what makes me feel that we really do need some serious it, shift in the meta. It's a problem. It's a problem at this point because it's becoming more and more prevalent. It's not gonna. It's not slowing down at all, and it's driving out a lot of the innovation in the format because you're not seeing, you know, people. If you if you want to bring some creative, interesting deck to to a tournament, you're going to get obliterated a lot of the times by Blue Farm unless you really, you know, really tech against it, really spend a lot of time thinking about it, you know, get a lot of reps in against it. You're you're, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have a hard time, and especially because you know one, one Blue Farm. A deck in a pot is one thing. Once you have two, or sometimes even three, it just it's very very difficult. You know, you talk about mid range hell. Everyone's got draw engines online. Everyone's drawing like crazy. Everyone's got interaction. It just it just the games get really really bring like, back no nasty. Thief. Yeah, <laughs> nasty. They get <laughs> nasty. Um, and the and the one exception to that, the one the one deck that's performing very well in the blue farm meta is Sisse. What Sisse has going for it is Sisse is very difficult to interact with. Sisse is built around being difficult to interact with. Like a lot of times, Sisse is not casting any spells at all, right? They get Sisse on the battlefield and then they are tutoring to the battlefield, casting no spells, drawing no cards to those Ristics and Mystics and just playing, you know, very tight. Um, and the other thing that's going on, I think if you look at the blue farm list, you'll see that the blue farm list continue to tilt more and more. Turns out all gas, you know, no break strategy, which means they're taking out a lot of the removal spells or- They're cutting or tools that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So these are these are these are tools that are really good against Sisse that they've been pulling out to just win faster and faster, and which has so, created this opening for Sisse to play really well. I there was one thing you said that resonates with me the most. It's it's my primary reason for why Sisse is doing so well. It actually isn't that Sisse is hard to interact with. Like that's that's a that's a feature of the deck, and it's a really great thing about the deck. Specifically, what is doing so well in Sisse is the fact that it doesn't cast spells. Because right. we're in a format right now where everyone has their, like the, the primary strategy for a lot of decks is tutor for Ristic and Mystic. Everyone wants to be drawing their cards as you're casting spells. They want to punish you casting spells. You have to give them resource to do so. Sisse is a deck that doesn't need to cast a lot of spells. And so while other decks, yep. you know, if I try and go off on Omnixilis, if I try and go off in Talion, if I try and go off in the majority of the decks in the format and 
two players have a Ristic or a Mystic on the battlefield, they're drawing a lot of those cards, and a lot of those cards could potentially be answers to stop my win attempt, which results right. in me losing the game, and then one of those players who drew a shitload of cards winning the game. Sisse is one of the few decks that says, that's really great. I'm going to cast this Dockside and nothing else. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yes. yep. Yep. Can you I'm going to activate. Side? I'm going to activate okay. again. I'm going to do another activation. Okay. Gonna... I would like to get Aminatu and blink it. Okay. I would like to get Sahili and copy Dockside. Okay. I would like to get Nicobolus Dragon God and be Aminatu and blink Dockside. I would like to get Teferi's thing. What is it? Teferi's Oath of Teferi. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I, I cast no more spells. You lose the game. Now I make infinite mana and now I kill you with Mount Doom. <laughs> like. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> like, okay. Exactly. Yeah. So, so Sisse is really well positioned. And I think that's why it's the one deck that's kind of. You know, doing well in the face of blue farm the other decks that you know have really kind of fallen off i mean we saw even rock side so rock side does well too uh, but rock side just basically does well because it's so fast and, and and it does a lot of the same things that blue farm's doing so you know rock side continues to do well um but then kinnon has really fallen off really hard uh, you're wow. you're being the one exception and i have some theories about why um, I think a big part of it Let's is, hear is that, yours. I have my yeah, theories. Let's hear yours. I'm sure you're going to say that. It, it, I think it'll be similar, but like I think a, a big part of it is a lot of the great players who were playing Kinnon have stopped. They're not playing it as much anymore. I'm not seeing as many of the same players. Like, when was the last time you saw Stony Tony in a, in a, in a tournament? Okay. My little tone, like. right? Uh, where's uh um God, what, what was the guy's name? El Dorito. I haven't seen him he's play. A, he's a kid, you know. What I mean? Okay, That's right. So he's not yeah. playing Kinnon anymore. So, like, a lot of these guys who were topping tournaments with Kinnon aren't playing Kinnon anymore. Um, and there's sort of a new generation picking up Kinnon and trying to run with it. Um, the other part of it is, is that Kinnon is very targeted right now. Everyone freaks out when they see Kinnon on the table. They're expecting to lose at any minute. And they're going to remove Kinnon as fast as they possibly can. They're going to hinder Kinnon as fast as they possibly can. And it makes it very hard for Kinnon to do well right now. Um, and the exception is pilots who really know the deck, who really know what they're doing. And are able to navigate a lot of that, you know, both politically and uh, you know, with their charm and their, and their you know, full head of hair and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I really like this. <laughs> very, very fluffy, man. You're very fluffy. Thank you, thank you. Right. The so what do you think? is I coming mean, back. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely, Kinnon is is very, very targeted right now, which is kind of it's wild to see it being so targeted over something like Blue Farm, but it makes sense when you when you dig down into the actual play patterns of the deck. Kinnon presents you with something that is an easy target. Kinnon presents you this thing that you can point at and say, "Kill that now." That's what wins the game. Blue Farm is really good at innocuously drawing cards that they shouldn't be allowed to draw. Where we talked about this before, where I said, just kill the fucking Timna. Why does no one kill Timna? You know, Timna is not something that wins the game. It's not a combo piece. It's not an outlet. It's not any of these things. It's just card advantage. So people so rarely just kill Timna. And then Blue Farm's like, right. cool, uh, draw, lose two, gain two, draw two, uh, lose three, draw three. Like, like they just do that turn after turn after turn. And then they lose and they're like, oh, what was I supposed to do? And I'm like, well, if you had use that one random removal spell that you held in your hand that entire time on Timna three turns ago, they would have drawn eight less cards. Yeah. So your, your Pongify equaled minus eight cards for Blue Farm. Yeah, or bro, you, like, you, you didn't want to like, block with your two dorks. You, you had yeah. your two dorks block. Yeah. I know I, think, I know it sets you back a little bit, but it sets you back less than they're moving ahead. right? Mm -hmm. and, and people are just so hesitant to, to do that, to let the Timna through, and it's tough. tough. Yeah, the other thing about Blue Farm is Blue Farm is very versatile. So you look at Sisse, right? And I play a Curse Totem. Curse Totem shuts Sisse down as long as that Curse Totem's in play. I play an Oppo Agent, shuts Sisse down. Uh, if I play you know, Weathered Runestone, it shuts off Kinnon, or at least an angle of Kinnon, a good piece of it. I mean, not completely, obviously, but significantly. Significantly shuts off a good bit of Kinnon. With with uh, Blue Farm, Blue Farm's like, yeah, okay, cool. You shut off my Breach Line. All right, I'll win with Meme Betrayal. I'll win with Thassa's Oracle. I'm still drawing cards, so I don't fucking care. Like I'm still, still online. Like you, it's very difficult to shut off multiple angles of Blue Farm. They're just not susceptible to it. You know, the big Blue ones Farm, are like Torpor Orb, but people aren't playing Torpor Orb right now. Torpor Orb doesn't really do it. Know? It just shuts off Dockside. It doesn't shut down Breach at all. Like it, you're, you're correct. Blue Farm, in in similarity yeah. to Kinnon, is never fully shut off by one piece. You know, Sisse is like an oppo's there. They're shut off while that oppo is there the majority of the time. Obviously, could you draw into the exact pieces to just win the game without tutoring? Sure. But like, realistically speaking, on your average game, oppo tells Sisse to get fucked. Curse Totem tells Sisse to get fucked. Curse Totem is great against Kinnon, but Kinnon still functions. Grafty's Cage or Weathered Runestone is great against Kinnon, Kinnon still functions. 
Blue Farm is in a similar category where it still functions through any individualized piece and incredibly well, like very, very well. And because of the way the deck is designed, where we talk about how it's just all of this gas, if you look at the decks that play all of that gas, like Rogsai or Blue Farm, they also have a very, very deep interaction package that allows them to sometimes function as a control deck. And when you're in a control mode, Control is all a question of resource management, which means you need to have card advantage. While Rogsai can only go into control mode while it has specifically Ristic or Mystic, because that's what they got. If they're going for Necro and Oz, whatever, they're trying to win the game. Blue Farm is able to very effectively fall back and say, oh, there's a Grafter's yes. Cage. I'm not doing anything right now. I'm just going to draw some cards with Timna. Hold up their mana, hold up their key pieces of interaction to just make sure no one can win and just grind out that game incredibly well. Yep, they are 100%. positioned to be a control deck if they want to swap into that role, but they are very, very efficient at winning the game when that window presents itself. Yeah, or and, when and they force through their own window because they have white and granite ball. Sure. And 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 Timna and Krom are not combo pieces. They the entire win lines and the and the way that deck functions is self contained within the deck itself. It doesn't need the commanders at all. The purpose of the commanders are draw engines, and that's it. So you know that means uh, like you know Drenith Magistrate. Now, all the things that normally like will shut off lines for a lot of other decks, that Blue Farm doesn't care. Blue Farm gets another draw engine online and they're fine. They don't need it. They don't need Tim and Grom. They can they can function with another draw engine just fine. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a big problem. Um, and you know one of the other things that's kind of going on, and this is not a criticism. I'll just say this is not a criticism. One of the things with EDH Top 16 in in particular is EDH Top 16 is really really good at showing tournament results really good at showing you know what decks are putting up results it's really bad at showing innovation like it's really bad at showing you know decks that are coming up that are you know being played in small numbers or being played in smaller tournaments it's very difficult for us as a community to be able to pull from the EDH top 16 as a resource to see a lot of that so what's happening is you know when people go and look at what decks to play like the obvious choice is blue farm right mm -hmm. because it's the data is the data. The data shows that's the deck to play. And I think what's the problem with that is that the entire community is becoming more and more and more, you know, focused on Blue Farm, just play Blue Farm. They just want to spike a tournament and they're not innovating as much. We're not looking at new decks as much. There's not as much uh, brewing going on. It's just like, let's take Blue Farm and go. Um, and, you know, that's kind of a concern, which kind of segues a little bit into a separate side conversation that I've been having. Uh, which is, you know, I've reached out to the, you know, CDH decklist database people a, a million times and argued with them up and down. You know the history with Florian and Ahav <laughs> database. Just look at me like that, <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> Keep your friends close and your enemies close. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but but um, I've been having a lot of good side conversations. You know, there is supposedly, I'm told. Um, change is coming, and I think um, you know, there's going to be like you heard it here first. It Florian change. will be on the database. Florian will be <laughs> we'll on the see. database. Yeah, it, you know, but you know, there's some changes going on. People are asking, actually, like genuinely interested in my opinion. I had a long conversation with Squirrel Mob, who I've given nothing but shit over the over the over the last year or whatever, who genuinely was willing to hear me out and listen to what I think you know the database should do. And I believe that the database does have a role to play in the community, which is, you know, that 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 lacking, uh, you know, ability to see innovation and things that aren't, you know, the top of the meta, right? Because EDH top 16 is great in, in showing the top of the meta. It doesn't do as good a job at providing resources for what's coming and what's being brewed and what's going on. And we do need to see more of that. Um, obviously, the problem with the DDB historically is it didn't take tournament results into, in, into consideration. That obviously needs to change. You need to be able to see both. You know, it, like in that resource, you need to see what are people playing in tournaments and winning with. And then you also need to be able to see what are people brewing and what ideas are there out there. So I like the idea of a database yeah. being able to let you just click on it, almost similar to what we did on our Discord, where we just have like the best tournament list pinned. You know what I mean? Like I like the idea of, sure. of the database being like, cool, Shurikai is an archetype. It is a proven archetype. See which Shurikai, like every few months, just check in which Shurikai deck is actually doing the best. Make that the database list, but just leave it as Shurikai. You know, if my Kinnan yeah. deck stops performing and a different Kinnan deck does, swap it out. If, yeah, if and my the cool, op deck the cool isn't thing, performing and someone else is, swap it out. Like, that's fine. Well, 
Yeah, and the cool thing is, it's like there's all these communities that have emerged around these different decks, right? So you have there's an amazing Sisse Discord that has all the different Sisse players and brewers all in one place. And if you ask that community, hey, what what are the good Sisse decks? All hail Malcolm Beckford. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but these guys know what the what what the good Sisse decks are. And instead of it being this you know clout game where you know someone who's known has a name outside of Sisse submits a Sisse list. And everyone goes, oh, well, obviously that guy, you know, he knows what he's doing, so he, he gets it. No, go talk to the Sisse community. Ask them what are the right decks to put on there, and they'll tell you. And you have to be willing to go out and touch those communities and and get information from them. Like, that has to be the way forward. And, you know, to Squirrel Mob's credit, I mean, he really listened. Seemed genuinely, like, on board with what I was saying. We'll see. You know, it's one thing to talk about, another thing to actually take action, so we'll see. But... I'm a little bit, you know, cautiously optimistic. So, you know, we'll see. <laughs> Just didn't think I'd see the day you said something potentially positive about the database. Look at you go. Look at how look at how far you've grown. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. It's like we'll we're 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 entering season three of a TV show and things are coming together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then and and maybe at some point the proper Rakdos deck will be on the database and represented. Already is. Appropriately. Already is. Uh, oh yeah, to yeah. the sideboard of Ob, right? How, how long did it take you to get a top four on Florian? <laughs> how, lo how long? How long? This guy. This guy. <laughs> this guy. Speaking of meta warping. Speaking of meta warping. Yeah. <laughs> have you played any? Cool uh, have you played any CDH on MTGO? I have watched Waffle play. <laughs> how, how was it? It's fine. So so the one interesting thing that I really like about which I'm sorry, let's talk we're talking about MTGO online CDH play, which is now a league based thing. Super, super cool. Um, one thing I really like about it is the style of a chess clock, where each individual player has a specific amount of time, not just a time in a round. And what I love about that is that right there is the format to play control and stacks. Because if you if you actually look at control and stacks players turns, they don't got a lot yeah, of decisions. Quick. They're yeah. quick. They're quick. What takes time is everyone else fucking thinking. And then the round ends and the game goes to a draw. If you have a chess clock, suddenly these very powerful stacks and control archetypes that have just been underrepresented because of time in rounds can now effectively dominate. So I expect that meta to be significantly slower, significantly less proactive decks, a much higher percentage of stuff like Talion, Tivit, Elevir, you know, whatever Jetmir type stacks you want to play. Like that is the meta for it right there because you are not limited by your opponents being slow yeah but the the flip side of that is you know games are going to be decided because there wasn't enough time to execute complex cdh lines yes so that is the thing i don't like about it which I, i've heard from people that it's been pretty good where the majority of the time if someone presents a loop or presents something that obviously wins and can explain it in typing or whatever people scoop like people have been really good about just scooping and letting them win no one like very few people have been dicks about that but i don't like the idea that let's say i'm playing kinnon and and someone has an angel's grace you know or, or i guess that's not a good way to do it let's like like someone someone has a Ristic study on board and they also have an angel's grace in hand and so rogsai is on their final fortune turn and they want to make them play it out even though rogsai has shown deterministic line that could realistically win the game in their brain they're like i want to let you play it out as long as possible draw so i can draw cards. Arista cards and then i'm gonna play an angel's grace and that option could exist but it's unlikely and so i'm frustrated the idea of playing kinnon and i have to click my basalt monolith a few hundred times yeah yeah exactly. you know what i mean and it and it gets awkward like to do all or imagine doing a hall breaker or a combo on mtgo like that's probably thousands of clicks to get that done and it's really awkward if someone does have a late in the line answer that they're waiting to use right and so what are they supposed to do they, they don't the want to say bind. scoop it up yeah or they want to sit on their trick bind and let you do your stupid bullshit and then and then waste your time you know whatever it is it, it it's like it puts you in a weird place where you might just accuse someone of being a dick for not scooping it but you can't present a loop in the same way that you can just do it in paper and say i have 10 million mana so that's yes. that's what's awkward yes. about it. Which 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 is meta warping because what's going to happen is people are going to lean away from decks that have, you know, holebreaker horror loops built into them that you have to work through under, you know, difficult circumstances, and you're lean into things that are more linear. You know, like the first the first thought I had when 
you know, the leagues were announced, so I'm like, I'm just gonna play Goto. Yeah, just straightforward, one. gas, like, you know, no complexity, just let's go, boom. I've got Goto, I'm just gonna keep, you know, infinite, let's go, done. You know, not complicated. You know, whereas if I'm, I'm playing like Florian, for example, right? Jesus, I have to like look at seven cards, like in the awkward interface, I gotta pick okay, one. That's and I'm like, not a big well, deal. But, <laughs> well, but then I'm casting. I cast a breach. And I'm like, okay, grinding station. Click. You know, point to myself. Click. You know, pick the three cards. Click. Untap. Click. That's like, just, in like, my opinion, one of the better ones. That one's like not a big deal in my eyes. Like I do. A grinding I, I think station about doing too. that MTGO, and I want to shoot myself in the face, dude. It's just right. Awful. But it's actually, it's actually very similar to playing it on paper because you still have to do all the individual movements. The problems are you can't present loops. Like something that, like yeah. a grinding station in person, I still have to put my mana crypt, exile the cards, tap my grinding station, take three cards off the top of my deck, look at them, decide which next three. Like you still have to do that in paper. That's not, it, it's that's obviously worse on MTGO, but it's it's not as bad relatively to something like I want to present 10 million mana or I want to do this loop X amount of times. That's where it gets awkward because if people have responses after those loops, <laughs> yeah, it gets really complicated. Right, right, fair. There. But it, like I said, it like it's going to warp the meta a bit. People are going to be much less inclined to play complicated lines. I think it's going to create a meta that's very different than paper meta. Uh, and then my concern there is, is, is at that point, is MTGO a good place for me to practice whatever deck I want to play in paper? Probably not. So it becomes a separate environment, separate meta. It also know, is, is missing fine. some cards. It is missing. It some is. I, I can't like. I, I don't know. I also don't know like. Like there's these people who rent your deck, so the way it works is you you get a rental account basically and you get a certain number of tickets that you can use towards a deck that you rent. And the people who provide those decks don't have every card either. Uh, like for example, I, I don't know the name of the, the, the one who does it, but they don't have imposter mech. So I can't run Italian because I can't run imposter mech. Or Wait, Florian you Wild run Magic Surge isn't versions. available. Yeah. You play that? Yeah, that card's great. I cut that shit out of Ob so long ago. Yeah, it's necessary. Yeah, yeah. 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 I stand anyway. by. By the way, if you if you send me Florian, I will I will run it for a tournament. I'm gonna, I'm gonna so I'm gonna order a proxy version of it to send you so you can play it. And you'll, you'll send me Florian. I'll send you the proxy version. Yeah. If I win the event on Florian, what do I get? Oh Jesus Christ! What do I get? <laughs> you just get to talk shit to me for the rest of my life. What else do you that's want? That's true. That would, honestly, honestly, is that everything you could dream of? Yeah, it kind of is. Yeah. yeah, I don't need to offer you anything else, dude. What are you talking about? Uh, I am excited yeah. to run an event on Tameshi sometime soon. That one's going to be fun. I got to I gotta get that proxied as well because I really it's enjoy super playing that. Yeah. It's a super fun deck. It's a super fun deck, yeah. yeah. yeah I like playing cool. a deck that just no one knows what the fuck you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Talk about Brewer's Advantage. You're like, wait, what? What? What are you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, don't worry about it. It's, it's good. It's nothing. It's well, nothing that's like, worry. I love, dude, Naestrom's <laughs> politics are so funny whenever you play against him, if you listen in, because he's explaining one of the win lines of the deck and they, how they don't have to be worried about it. And then he just uses one of the other win lines. And I'm just like, like I know you do this. Like I know that's yeah, 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 yeah. In order for this to work, I, I you know, I need to. Yeah, have, he's like, uh, it, someone's like, oh, the copy artifact line. Yeah, yeah, I would like, I would need this artifact land here. I need to get my copy artifact. I need to get my lotus bloom. I'm missing like two of those pieces. Like, you know, that's that's not what I'm doing right now. And people are like, oh, okay. And then he's like, cool, mine over matter. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So okay. Um, so with all of the changes happening in the meta, you know, with MTGO coming online, with the lying, with Blue Farm taking over, thank God we have the EDH Rules Committee looking oh. out for us, oh. you know, really putting in a lot of effort to, you know, produce documents and rules and ban lists and things that, you know, keep us all safe and, and help us sleep at night, right? I mean, they worked on this last one for two years. For two they, years. For two years. For two years. For and two. They, they saw it. You know, they said, oh, your meta's stale. Oh, you guys have complaints about lack of changes. We got you. Uh, and yeah. this was this was a this was a big announcement. Yeah, so so here here's here's the announcement. I'll put it up on screen. It's very exciting. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. no changes. Uh, no changes. Yeah, no changes at all. But uh, my favorite thing was the um, it, it said it said we've released an important update of the philosophy page, clarifying the rule committee's vision for the format. No change of direction. 
<laughs> and then there's like three paragraphs of ha about having fun and encouraging positive experiences while playing. And then, and, and then Jim LePage, if I pronounce that right, talked about everyone on the rules committee having a hand and working so hard on this. And, you know, he worked on this with Sheldon prior to his passing and, and talked about how, you know, we don't want to say it's all about competitive and everyone has their own subjective form of fun. And like, we're not saying it can't be competitive, but like not actually saying anything of substance. There was, there yeah. was no legitimate substance in any of these documents or any of these messages. It just sounded like shitty fluff that someone typed up on their five minute break off when they needed to say something. Yes. Yes. Which is, you know, frankly, you know, kind of unfortunate because we do kind of need some guidance. We do kind of need some, you know, oversight and looking at things and trying to think about how to, you know, keep the format alive and, and, you know, interesting. And, and that's outside. not happening. Yeah. And it banned oxide. Banned Unban Black Lotus. Okay. Let's relax. Yes. We just, we just talked about how Rock Side yes. is doing really well right now. Can we not unban Black yes. Lotus? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but right. you know it's unfortunate. Like, and and you know, no offense to those guys. Like, you know, Rebel and Jim. Those, you know, you know, they're both. You know, they, they mean well. They mean Yo, well. Imagine, both. imagine turn one on the play, land a Bandicrypt Black Lotus consecrated Sphinx. Don't don't unban Black Lotus. <laughs> Fuck, that's that's a horrible idea. Don't sounds hot. It. It sounds that's really good. Idea. Oh my yeah. god. <laughs> yeah, you do turn one Tibbet too, right? Just yeah, turn one, turn one ridiculous. Tibbet. Yeah, land, yeah. land, Black Lotus, Jewel Lotus, Tibbet. <laughs> that's hilarious. Oh, that'd be so funny. Yeah, you could do that a nine like, commander. You could do you, I, could do you do Black Lotus, Jewel Lotus, Lion's Eye Diamond. Yeah, Atraxa. You you can go land Lotus Petal Jewel Lotus Black Lotus Atraxa. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You actually have one mana left over. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I I I like we we ended up agreeing to an ID and playing it out. But in that tournament I played on Ob a few weeks ago, I won a game from fourth seat, like one because we agreed to ID, but we played it out. Um, I went <laughs> Mulda four in fourth seat, turn one LED Jewel Lotus Ob, pass with no other permanents, and play it no hand. Hell yeah. I've done that with Florian, dude. I've done it. <laughs> and then, and then I don't I, need a hand. Fuck I, it. But, but the, way, the way I won was uh, I had a bunch of pingers on board at this point, untapped with like a few cards in exile, not too many, but I had like Kessig and shit like that, the, the pingers. And so I started going off, <laughs> you know, started the turn with the dock side, and the person was like, okay, cast silence. And then I had enough pingers and instants that I could go for that I burned them out with the silence on the stack. <laughs> yeah, player removal is uh, interaction. <laughs> It's yeah, it's good room. Oh yeah, oh yeah, hell yeah. Um, I will, I will give a quick shout out. Just um, you know, if you remember, you know, months and months ago, we had the, you know, when we had the top four. There was that huge controversy over the the forced ID uh, in in uh, round five of of uh, Mox Masters January, and the guy who was forced into that that draw uh, didn't make top sixteen because of it. Uh, the Papa Squats, uh, mm -hmm. Nick. He just won Path to the Peak this month, so huge shout out and congratulations to him, man! Great job. I was also I was I was casting in the first couple of rounds of Path to the Peak four because um, I, oh, I yeah. took a week off from I, I took a week off from tournaments. I went and did a barbecue and watched some UFC with my buddies instead of playing a tournament because I had you know Punt City three into Salt Fest the following week, and I was like, let's, let's take a little break. But uh, I cast in the morning a little bit, and we were casting one of Papa Squats games, and accepted was like, I need to know how much Papa Squats squats. And so I, yes. I literally, <laughs> I read it right as they finished the game. I hopped into the pod and I was like, question from the stream. How much do you squat? And it was, it was like not a number as high as I was expecting. It was like 260 or 270. And I brought it back and Alex was like, oh, well, that's disappointing. But now they've talked about it on Twitter. And he was like, no, that's like my 10 rep. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That sounds <laughs> like, right. That's right. <laughs> but yeah, dude, Nick, congratulations, dude. I'm, 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 we're very happy for you, man. Well earned. Hey, also and, uh, we had we had one of my ob coaches, Skelt, in top sixteen of that same event. Nice, nice. I know Skelt. Always good to see good him dude. back there. Yeah, yeah. So and and you know that's exciting. Path of the Peak is growing. You know, I had just shy of seventy players this time, so it's growing. It's becoming. It's kind of eclipsed chaos a little bit. Um, you know, hopefully... I mean, it did on that day. Twin Flame had three or four entries in Path of the Peak yeah. at seventy. So, yeah. So you know, the, the good news is is the online. You know, webcam tournament scene is not dead. Yeah, it's on the decline, but you know, there's still some hope. There's some glimmer of hope there. So, hopefully, it comes around and 
no you see more of it i do hope that the online tournaments return with strength i miss them i care a lot about them obviously they're what got me into the format we are definitely leaning a little more towards in person and paper everyone's lgs is running a tournament every week for top deck points and you know it's decreased attendance online for sure um i definitely yep. think there's too many online events so i'll stand by that i think make them one or two a month again make them something exciting that people look forward to and i think they will do better right. Because I would like agree. to return to them, but they just when there's 30 people in them, it's not worth it for me. Yeah, I agree with like, a thousand percent. If I, I if I'm if there's only 30 people in it, I go to my LGS and there's a tournament. Exactly, and there's a yes. local with 45 or 50, and I'm like, okay, I'll go do that and get cash immediately. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, and yeah. you get to actually gather with people. Mm -hmm. Oh, play is magic. it called Magic the Gathering? The gathering? Yeah, 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 the Gathering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all we got for today. You wanna? And take us out. Thank you so much for listening to the Colors of Crutch podcast. My name is Max Sternberg, also known as Wounded Satellite, and I was joined by the ultimate fucking dog of a co host, Max P, the Italian man. If you enjoy our content, please don't forget to like and subscribe. If you want to support us even more, you can go to our Patreon. We've got lots of fun tiers and perks to choose from. And if you want to join the conversation, Outside of YouTube, you can join our Discord. Link to that also in the description below. If you're interested in CDH coaching, I offer that. You can find me on Discord or on Twitter, both as Wounded Satellite. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I'll talk to you next time.